And then let's add one more thing to this that I should have mentioned at the beginning of the video because sometimes I get these things right. Howdy, welcome back to Dion Talk. What do you do to get to that third or fourth mortgage after you have a primary house and a rental and you only make maybe 40, 50 or $60,000 a year? So banks generally wouldn't lend because your debt to income ratio becomes too tight to qualify for that next loan. Today, I have Millennial Mike, who is investing in real estate. He house hacks in a high cost of living area and then invests at a distance because on some level, I think he's even lazier than I am. I self-manage my 16 rental units close. And for most of my working career, uh, I generally never made more than $50,000 until around 2018, I started making pretty decent money. But before then, where I was a law enforcement officer, it was a small town. I think my uh, my best year there was $46,000 just before 2008 when the recession hit and I got laid off. I think, Mike, you make six figures, but it's not multiple six figures. So you're doing pretty well. But how do we get those loans after the first couple? Because that debt to income ratio, which is the lenders look at your recurring expenses. And then they say, based on your income, these recurring expenses are a percentage of that income. FHA, which is not designed for first time home buyers, you can use it as a first time home buying option, but it is generally designed for somebody who has bad credit and a bad debt to income ratio will go up. And this does change often up to 43%, 50% it hovers around there. A conventional loan, which is a better product to buy your first property with can go 39%, 43%. So it takes a lower debt to income ratio often to use a conventional loan than it does to use FHA. But after you have a couple of mortgages, your debt to income starts to be more than your income. So it's 100, 120%. Mike has some creative strategies that he's going to use. And then I'm going to wrap up with kindergarten simple ways to keep adding mortgages, even if you're not making a lot of money. Go ahead, Mike. Yeah, so a couple things. Um, first of all, first of all, I think it's important that we define like debt to income, because there's people out there who might not recognize what that is. And you could have this problem with your second mortgage. Shoot, you could have this problem with your very first mortgage that you can't qualify for as much as you would like. So because when federal lending standards got restricted and became tighter after the aftermath of the 2007-2008 financial crisis, lenders are only allowed to give you a certain amount of debt relative to your income. That's your debt to income ratio. And so if you want to qualify for a house, but if you have like credit card debt and you have a car payment, those are things that already get factored into your debt to income ratio that can affect how much you can qualify for on a house. So that's why it's very important to be conscious of your debt to income. And you might say, I barely qualified for my first house. How in the heck am I going to qualify for a second mortgage or a third mortgage? And that's the purpose of this video. So I'm going to talk about the creative things that you need to do. First of all, if you are right now immediately starting to learn about seller financing, creative financing, owner financing, they're all names for the same thing, or subject to or assumable mortgages, you're doing yourself a major disservice. Interest rates for the last several years have been two, three, four percent Money was so cheap to borrow that there was no need to force yourself to learn these creative strategies to make loans and funding of your deals more palatable. But now that interest rates have gone from 3 to 7%, nothing cash flows anymore. And you're stuck looking at a market where sellers are not going to budge on price, but you can't afford to buy a bad deal. Your only option is throw random offers out to the tune of hundreds of lowball offers, hoping somebody accepts it, or you start to understand and learn some of these powerful strategies like creative financing. So what's seller financing? That's when an owner owns the property outright. They have significant equity or 100% equity in the property. And rather than going to a bank and asking the bank for a loan where the bank makes money and not you or the seller, you go to the seller and you convince them to finance the deal to you directly. You can make up whatever terms you want. They could be the exact same terms as a bank. 30-year amortization, 20% down, but with a better interest rate so the property still cash flows. I'm negotiating one seller financing deal right now. I currently have two that I've already negotiated and I make a seller financing offer with every single deal that I try to pursue. Every time I send a conventional offer across the table, I slide a seller financing offer along with it. And the seller financing offer is oftentimes better for the person. Unfortunately, not everyone's smart enough to take it, some people just want their money up front, which I respect. But if you don't need it up front, that's a great opportunity for seller financing. So then let's talk about assumables are subject to. 
Howdy. I hope you're enjoying my content. I definitely can't give you good relationship advice or teach you how to be a good parent, but I did put together a course where I share how I went from being a single parent with three kids, laid off from a police department after the 2008 recession. I started teaching people how to drive trucks and I was only making $17 an hour. I found out about $89,000 in bad debt in my name that I didn't know existed until the divorce. And starting from that position, I was still able to reach financial freedom, become bad debt free, and make work completely optional in less than a decade. You can find a link to this course in the description below. Now let's get back to the video. A lot of people who have purchased their properties in the last two or three years have negative equity. They bought it for 300K. It might even still be worth 300K. But when you sell a house, it costs money. You got to pay 6% in real estate fees. You might have to pay another 2 or 3% in closing costs and repairs. On average, it costs about 10% of the total value of the house to sell it, which means that anybody bought in the last two or three years who hasn't had any time for equity to grow, they are going to have to cut a check to sell their house. Most people don't have 10% of the purchase price on a $300,000 house. That's 30 grand. Most people don't want to cut a check for 30 grand to sell their house. That's an opportunity for assumable loans. What they do have purchasing in 2019, 20, 21, 22 is a two, three or 4% interest rate, an interest rate you can't get anymore. And you can go after it. You can go to this seller and approach them. And what I would say is you need to look at houses that were on the market that didn't sell and have recently become unlisted. It didn't sell because they probably couldn't get the price they needed to not cut a check. Now you need to aggressively pursue these people and do your best to say, what if I just assumed your mortgage and wrote you a check for 10 or 15,000 bucks? It's going to be cheaper than your down payment would have been. They solve their problem because they get some money and they don't have to cut a check. You get to assume the mortgage and get that low interest rate fixed over 30 years. It's a wonderful, powerful strategy you can use and avoid paying 7% interest rates. Now, I won't talk for another 10 minutes because there's so many different things we could talk about here, but you need to understand and learn these powerful strategies because that's going to help you grow your portfolio to the point where you get to be like me with 13 rental units, a triplex, two duplexes, six single family homes, or like Dion, who's got even more than I do. For a couple more weeks. <laughs> I think you'll quickly pass me in unit count because it's your goal. My goal is to possibly shrink my unit count. And you, you covered a lot of creative strategies. Uh, and now I'm going to wrap up with that kindergarten simple format for beating your debt to income problems. The way I did it, I've not done any creative financing. I have no subject to, no seller financing, nothing off of the list of things that you listed there. All of my properties were acquired from the MLS with conventional loans. I'm still making offers on properties from the MLS with conventional loans. When we start, we think of our debt to income ratio as our debt to income ratio. And your mind still thinks your income is your job. And for the first two years of investing, that's fairly accurate. I lived in a house. Um, I've always been good at keeping custody of my kids and my house, but I've never been good at keeping a girl around. Um, but I owned my house and I found out about $89,000 in bad debt in my name that I didn't know existed until the divorce, was a single parent raising three kids, got laid off from law enforcement and started working at a truck driving school making $17 an hour. Income, $17 an hour, house with a mortgage, bad debt to income ratio. How do you buy a house? How do you even get the first one? I'm in that boat that Mike talked about. If YouTube University existed to the extent that it does now in 2008, I probably would have educated myself and maybe found some of those creative strategies. Started looking at subject two, seller financing. One of the biggest barriers that you're probably going to run into when you first look at those is a lot of agents are going to tell their sellers that it's illegal because the agent thinks sometimes that the buyer is trying to eliminate the agent fees. So if you're going to use any of those creative strategies and there is an agent involved, make sure you let them know that your intent is to make sure they get paid so that they don't talk the seller out of even looking at your offer. There are ways to get to the seller without going through an agent. Um, and those are more of the creative things that Mike talks about on his channel here on YouTube, Millennial Mike. But here's what I did. And this was based on the recommendation of the lender at the time telling me that you really can't qualify for anything because of your debt to income ratio. They said, unless you had rental income on your tax returns. If you were in the position to buy your house or your first rental with your debt to income ratio and you buy a rental, Two years later, once you have that rental income on your tax returns and you have proven yourself to the lender that you are a safe bet, you can find tenants, screen tenants, place tenants, maintain a property, do everything legally. That's what I did without buying a rental. 
I moved from my house into an apartment and rented the house out. For two years, I saved for that first house hack duplex and rented the house out. When I went to buy the duplex, the lender would look at the house income, cash flow, and the cash flow from the other half of the duplex. You can buy a triplex or a fourplex or a house with an EDU. There's creative ways to come up with house hacking strategies where you can add rental income to your debt to income ratio. Now, the lenders only look at 75% of the rents. So you want to make sure you're buying properties that cash flow. There was a second thing that the lenders will look at, and it was easier for me because I only had one rental. The lenders are going to want what they call the majority. So it means 51% of your rental units to have at least three months remaining. So month to month leases don't really help you much when it comes to your debt to income ratio. The lenders are going to want to see that they have at least three months remaining. So my house had a long-term lease when I purchased the duplex. Since the house was my only rental, meaning over 50% of my rentals had a long-term lease, they would look at the rental income from the duplex. Saved for two more years. My income went up a little, but not much. Like I said, most of my investing career, I never made more than $50,000, added a duplex, and a duplex, and then house act a fourplex. Then my income started to get a little better, added a triplex and a duplex. So I've gotten to 16 rental units now. And then let's add one more thing to this that I should have mentioned at the beginning of the video, because sometimes I get these things right. But not today. How do you get your next mortgage when you no longer have a W-2 job? It's the same answer. I've had rental income for over two years on my tax returns. My lenders have said me having a job is completely irrelevant and wasn't even looked at in my last three purchases. They didn't look at my income and my debt to income ratio. They looked at the property. After you have rental income for two years, the lenders are going to look at your rental income versus the mortgages and the next property, as long as that rental income would cover that, 75% of that rental income would cover that. They've told me that I can buy any property that I want as long as I've saved the down payment. So I'm making an offer. I'm thinking about making an offer right now on a million dollar property where I'll put 25% down and the lenders aren't even going to ask me what I do for work because they have my track record from tax returns, which is one of the reasons why you want to claim your rental income on your tax returns. And if you're doing this right, like Mike and I, both of us last year paid $0 in rental income tax, which means it looks like we made nothing, right? The lenders take out the depreciation, that, that special tool that exists in the real estate market that makes it possible for us to make money in this business. They take out the depreciation. So even though we paid no money in taxes, it looks like we made a lot of money to qualify for that next loan. So in the comments below, let me know what way you think is going to be the best way for you. Creative financing through the strategies that Mike talked about or the extremely lazy, simple methods that I talked about. Or probably a combination of both. If they want to reach out with questions, Mike, how can they find you? You can uh, find me on Instagram or YouTube at Millennial Mike. Just type it in and I'll pop up. Uh, and uh, Dion, thanks for having me on. Awesome. Thanks, Mike. Until my next video, thanks for coming to my Dion talk. We're sorry. The number you have dialed is not in service at this time. Oh, dude, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to flinch big time. All right, uh, hold on. <laughs> <laughs> when it comes to investing, you miss all the shots that you don't take.